In making this video, I've set myself an impossible task. The Dragonborn has no personality, no backstory. In The Elder Scrolls V, the Dragonborn is the brush, Skyrim is the canvas, and you, the player, are the painter. The Dragonborn is by and large a figment of the player's own imagination. Be that as it may, in this video, I'm going to tell you every decision I think the Dragonborn would canonically make in Skyrim. From what we know, the protagonists of past Bethesda games were two-dimensional heroes. Oblivion's protagonist, the hero of Kavach, as well as the protagonist of Morrowind, the Nereverin, are revered by subsequent generations as saviours, not as murderers, thieves, or madmen. I know that memory is fickle and legend untrustworthy. Maybe the hero of Kavach did become the head of the Dark Brotherhood, and no one ever found out about it. Perhaps the Nereverin after defeating Dagothur, became a sadistic necromancer who experimented on innocent people. It's possible. However, based on what we know, the scant information that has trickled down through the ages, the previous protagonists were good people. They were heroes. And on that basis, I'm going to say that the Dragonborn is a hero too. I think that we can also assume that the Dragonborn would try to stay as politically neutral as possible. Bethesda tends to tell us little about the decisions of past protagonists because they don't want to ruin our ability to play the past Elder Scrolls games. Therefore, if we imagine we're playing the Elder Scrolls 6 and are hearing about the legend of the Dragonborn, a lot of the information about their political allegiances would be ambiguous. Moreover, if we take the trailers as canon representations of the Dragonborn, which is a big if, then we know that the Dragonborn is a male Nord. I think we can also safely say that the Dragonborn is supposed to be a warrior, as opposed to a mage, thief, or bard. In the trailers, we see the Dragonborn wielding sword and shield and wearing banded iron armor. Equally, a Nord's in-game abilities arguably predispose them to being a warrior. There are quite a few areas where I'm not going to be able to comment on what decision the Dragonborn would have made. For instance, the home the Dragonborn would buy, or the house Carl he would favour, or the spouse he would choose to marry. Nonetheless, where I think I am able, and using the criteria I've set out, I'm going to endeavour to explain every decision the Dragonborn would make in Skyrim. The main quest of Skyrim is almost entirely linear. There is, though, one choice. To kill or not to kill Parthenax. After defeating Alduin for the first time atop the throat of the world, the leader of the Blades, Delphine, will ask you to kill Parthenax. She claims that Parthenax has to die because he was Alduin's lieutenant thousands of years ago. In spite of the fact that Parthenax is now a staunch enemy of Alduin and plays a critical role in finally defeating him for good, Delphine is of the opinion that for his past transgressions, Parthenax must die. It's also worth mentioning that she holds a low opinion of the Greybeards in general, thinking that their pacifism is weakness. If you choose to do Delphine's bidding and kill Parthenax, then you gain access to the Blades faction again, including the ability to recruit followers with whom to go on dragon hunts. If you don't kill Parthenax, then you lose access to the Blades, but you retain Parthenax and can continue to meditate on your shouting abilities with him. You also stay in the good graces of the Greybeards. It's worth noting that you can complete the main quest without killing Parthenax. It's not necessary to do Delphine's bidding to then go on to the final fight with Alduin. So, canonically, the Dragonborn would not kill Parthenax. There are a few reasons for this. Firstly, the Dragonborn is neither a judge nor executioner. I don't think the Dragonborn would see themselves as in a position to judge Parthenax. Secondly, Parthenax is indispensable to the fight against Alduin. Without Delphine, defeating Alduin would be a possibility. Without Parthenax, the Dragonborn would be doomed in their quest. Given the immense debt the Dragonborn thus owes to Parthenax, I believe that they would not ultimately kill him. Moreover, the Dragonborn isn't beholden to the Blades, and nor does he need them. He has little to gain by allying himself exclusively with them. The Blades are an organisation of two people living in a dilapidated temple. By contrast, the Dragonborn would probably want to keep the Greybeards, and by extension Parthenax, on side for future conflicts. After the Parthenax dilemma, the question of whether you should ally with the Stormcloaks or the Imperials is probably the most divisive choice in Skyrim. You'll find no end to YouTube videos and articles discussing the issue. I believe that all of you will at this point have a fully formed opinion about which side you think is the worthy one. However, I believe that the Dragonborn wouldn't join either side. Instead, the Dragonborn would focus on defeating Alduin 
and would bring both sides together for a temporary ceasefire. As I mentioned earlier, Bethesda do not like to undermine player choice in their previous games. On this basis, it makes sense that officially the Dragonborn would strike a neutral path and not get involved in the conflict at all. However, I admit that this isn't a clear-cut position. One could argue that it makes sense for the Dragonborn to support the Stormcloaks. For one, the Stormcloaks are fighting for the worship of Tiber Septim to be allowed again in Skyrim. Tiber Septim is the god of mankind and was a Dragonborn. It would make sense that the Dragonborn would enlist for a cause fighting in Septim's name. You could also say that the Dragonborn would support the Stormcloaks because he's a Nord, but just because the Dragonborn is a Nord doesn't mean he's naturally a Stormcloak. The majority of the Empire's fighters in Skyrim are Nords, don't forget. The Empire retains a lot of popularity in the province, in spite of what Ulfric and his lackeys might suggest. There's also a case to be made for the Dragonborn joining the Empire. Many past Emperors have been Dragonborn, albeit in a bit of a different sense to that of the protagonist of Skyrim. Subjects of the Empire prior to the Fourth Era would have described themselves as being ruled by Dragonborn Emperors. The origins of this term lie with Saint Alessia, who founded the Cyrodiilic Empire in the First Era in a covenant with the god Akatosh. The Dragon God imbued Alessia's line with, with blood from his own heart, initiating a sacred compact. The dragon fires would remain lit, and Oblivion's influence on Mundus barred, so long as the Dragonborn Emperors wore the Amulet of Kings. It seems that some of these Emperors possessed the Thum, but others didn't. Tiber Septim, for instance, is noted to have used the Thum in his conquest of the continent. And, like the hero of Skyrim, he was called to Hyrothgar by the Greybeards. The Dragonborn line of Emperors ended with the death of Ural Septim at the beginning of Oblivion. But it is the same Empire, founded by the Dragonborns, that the Mead dynasty are currently the custodians of. That fact alone may command the Dragonborn's loyalty. However, I do believe that Bethesda will canonically make the Dragonborn a neutral player in the Civil War. It's the easiest and least controversial option for them when it comes to safeguarding the continued ability of players to roleplay in Skyrim. In The Elder Scrolls VI, we'll probably hear about how the Dragonborn was too busy saving the world to get involved in the divisive civil conflict, which sorted itself out on its own. The Daedric quests are some of Skyrim's most popular, because A, they're often very wacky, and B, they tend to incorporate divisive choices. I'm going to split the Daedric quests into two categories. Firstly, we have Daedric quests with possible good endings. There are eight of these quests. Secondly, there are the Daedric quests that are plain evil. There may be no choices, or if there are, they are both evil. Eight of the Daedric quests also fall into this category. I'll deal with the first category of Daedric quests first. The quest for the Daedric Prince Azura begins when you come across a gargantuan shrine to her in the wilderness and make the steep climb up to the shrine out of curiosity. Talking to Aranea Leneth, the shrine's custodian, will kickstart the quest called the Black Star. The central choice in this quest is this, whether or not to side with Azura or to side with the mage Nelikar. Azura wants you to reclaim her star from the clutches of Malin, a deranged mage who has deposited his own soul in the star in an attempt to cheat death. Nelikar, a mage resident in the Winterhold Inn, and an expert in all matters Daedra, similarly wants you to purge Malin from the star, but he doesn't want you to do it for Azura. He claims that Azura, as a Daedra, is evil. He suggests that Azura deliberately drove Malin mad, and that, as a result, several students needlessly died in his experiments. He therefore argues that it's best to deprive the Daedra of her star and for you to use it for your own purposes. It cannot be said that Azura is straight up evil, I think. In Morrowind, the Dunmer revere the Queen of Dawn and Dusk as one of the good Daedra, and it certainly seems that Azura takes an interest in her mortal devotees in a way other Daedric princes simply don't. However, I still think the Dragonborn would find it difficult to side with Azura, for the simple reason that she is still a Daedra, which is a class of being the Dragonborn wouldn't want to be beholden to under any circumstances. There's perhaps another reason the Dragonborn would side with Nelikar, and that's simply that the reward is better than if you side with Azura. The base Azura star, which you will receive if you side with Azura, can only capture white souls that is to say, lesser souls, whereas the modified Azura star given you by Nelikar can capture both black souls and white souls. Clavicus Vile's quest begins when you find a talking dog on the outskirts of Falkreath. In this quest, your task is to reunite Barbus with his master, with whom he's had a falling out. After recovering the Ruleful Axe, which the Daedric Prince of Bargain says would restore his faith in Barbus, he asks you to use the weapon to kill the dog. In return, he offers to let you keep the rule for lax. If you refuse and save Barbus, you'll gain the Mask of Clavicus File, a cool looking helmet 
that boosts your persuasion and bargaining abilities. Murdering a dog is, I think, safe to say an evil choice and not one the Dragonborn would canonically choose, especially when that dog has sentience. Hercene's quest is one of the longer Daedric quests in Skyrim, but also one of the most interesting. In the course of this quest, you'll have the choice of either siding with Hercene and killing the werewolf Sinding, or helping Sinding and defying Hercene's will. For context, Sinding has attracted Hercene's ire because he stole the ring of Hercene in an attempt to control his transformations. In retaliation, Hercene cursed the ring and Sinding's plan backfired. He transformed at the worst possible moment in front of a defenseless little girl. It's for her murder that he's imprisoned in Valkreath jail, which is where you find him at the quest's beginning. Having taken the ring, you need to appease her scene in order to rid it of its curse. After doing so by taking down the white stag, he commands you to join the hunt for Sinding. Aiding her scene, buying into his cult of worship, would be evil, but supporting Sinding isn't good. Sinding killed an innocent child after all, and that's why you find him locked up in the prison to begin with. But he's at least remorseful. Sparing him offers him the opportunity to redeem himself, and he killed the girl whilst a werewolf, his transformation into which he couldn't control at the time because of the ring of her scene. So I think that having Sinding's back is the lesser evil in this quest, and also by backing Sinding, you don't become beholden to her scene as his champion. The quest involving the Daedric Prince of Destruction is called The Pieces of the Past, and it begins with Silas Vesuvius's ill-conceived plan to profit from the terrorist exploits of his ancestors in the form of a museum. But his museum isn't quite perfect. Although Silas has amassed dozens of artifacts, his collection isn't complete without Mayrune's razor. He tasks you with collecting the fragments of the weapon. Once you've taken the pieces of the razor to the mountaintop to have them reforged, Dagon will command you to kill Silas. Silas will, in turn, plead for his life, offering you a generous amount of gold for sparing him. Silas is a wriggly worm of a man, looking to profit off the exploits of his ancestors, ancestors who brought the entire plane of Mundus to the brink of destruction. But that being said, Silas hasn't really done anything wrong, and he certainly doesn't deserve to be murdered in cold blood, especially at the behest of the Prince of Destruction, responsible for almost destroying Mundus as we know it. So sparing Silas is the option that the Dragonborn would choose, and it would be the option the hero of Kavach himself would choose. The Dragonborn may be a good man, but he's no saint. I think it's therefore fair to assume that he would engage in the drinking contest with Sam Gwevin, who, of course, turns out to be the Daedric Prince of Debauchery, Sanguine. There are no choices in this particular Daedric quest, but given that it's more or less harmless and the Dragonborn wouldn't have known that Sam was in fact Sanguine, he probably would do it, and Nord like to drink, after all. Similarly, Shagarath's quest is one the Dragonborn would fulfil. I mean, of course a hero is going to jump at the chance to help a deranged old man on the street, and arguably the outcome of the quest is also a positive one. Having miraculously found himself in the broken and apparently foggy mind of Pelagius, the Dragonborn must fix it in order to escape. The Dragonborn comes away from the mission, not only having reunited the elderly madman with his master, but having remedied the insanity of Pelagius. Dawnstar, the small mining town shivering on Skyrim's northernmost shore, is unassuming. It's a shock then to discover the inn awash with locals complaining about being terrorised by nightmares. Thus begins the Daedric quest of Vermina, the prince of dreams and nightmares. Arandor is your guide in this quest. Formerly a devotee of Vermina, Arandor is now in the service of Mara, goddess of love. When you reach the end of Nightcaller Temple, you're faced with a choice. Sacrifice Arandor and gain the Skull of Corruption, or side with Arandor and destroy it. It goes without saying at this point that the Dragonborn would not choose to side with the Daedric Prince or to kill a good man in cold blood. He would thus side with Arandor to purge Vermina's influence from the temple and to restore the sound sleep of the denizens of Dawnstar. I mentioned earlier that I've categorised the Daedric quests in two. The previous quests I just talked about were those I felt the Dragonborn could complete with his morality intact. The following are Daedric quests the Dragonborn would not choose to complete altogether because they all have evil outcomes. The Daedric Prince Meridia is slightly different to other princes. She's the prince of life and light and harbours a deep hatred for the undead, so she's often considered one of the good Daedric princes, like Azura. But that being said, it hardly seems like she's a paragon of good. She reportedly boasts an army of living humanoids that she's stripped of free will. People often also forget that Umaril the Unfeathered, the main antagonist of the Knights of the Nine DLC for Oblivion, is a champion of Meridia. Umaril the Unfeathered was an alien sorcerer king who once ruled Tamriel 
and enslaved most of the human population, and he was Meridia's chosen. So on this basis, I think the Dragonborn would probably leave Meridia's request to cleanse her temple unfulfilled. But perhaps my perception of this quest is marred by the fact that I'm a massive fan of Oblivion, and I played it before I played Skyrim, so I have a particular dislike of Umarul the Unfeathered and his master. One of the most unique abilities you can acquire in Skyrim is cannibalism. If you play out the taste of death the way that the Daedric Prince Nimira wants you to, then you can come away with the, I hesitate to say ability, so depravity, to munch on corpses to regain health. Of course, the Dragonborn would never stoop to doing such a thing. Can you imagine midway through the fight against Alduin, the Dragonborn furrowing among the slain bodies of his comrades, looking for a juicy morsel to snack on? So when asked by Ayla to bring a priest to the Cave of the Dead as a sacrifice, the Dragonborn would instead purge the cave of its depraved cultists. Boethia's calling is Skyrim's most brutal quest. In it, Boethia, the Daedric Prince of Murder, asks you to sacrifice a follower in return for her favor. After doing so, she asks you to murder her entire cult and her former champion. The Dragonborn would not murder all of these people in order to gain Boethia's favor, even for the ebony armor, which does look epic. Equally, nor would the Dragonborn take heed of Mephala when she sinisterly whispers through the basement door in Dragon's Reach. Also, I think common sense dictates you generally wouldn't open an old door at the behest of a disembodied woman who clearly has been terrorizing a child. And even if the Dragonborn did open the door, there's no way he would kill a bunch of innocents to sate the ebony blade, as Mephala suggests. Malakath is another of those ambiguous Daedric princes. The Dunma consider him a troublesome deity, but to orcs he's sacred. It's through an orc tribe that the Dragonborn comes into contact with Malakath, god of curses. The tribe in question wants to regain their favour with the deity. Now, the quest itself doesn't have a particularly evil outcome, but the Dragonborn, I think, would avoid doing the bidding of Malakath if at all possible, and so would probably leave the orcs to sort their own mess out. Molag Baal. Okay, I think you can all guess where this one is going. There's nothing ambiguous about it. Molag Baal is evil, maybe the most evil Daedric Prince. So fulfilling his wishes in any way whatsoever is something the Dragonborn would flat out refuse to do, particularly when the task is to subdue and beat to death a priest of a rival god in a dank underground dungeon. Periite, again, is one of the more ambiguous princes, so Periite's charge is disease and sickness. Some argue that the prince is therefore a personification of nature, albeit its worst and most brutal aspects. Even so, to complete this quest, you have to submit yourself to Periite's will, and so I think actively supporting a being intent on spreading pestilence and killing innocents is not something the hero of Skyrim would choose to do. Nocturnal is a bit of a special case because Nocturnal's quest is bound up with the Thieves Guild questline. Some members of the Thieves Guild espouse a bit of a dodgy Robin Hood philosophy, claiming that the organization does good by redistributing wealth from rich to poor. That's a romantic interpretation that's really pushing the limits of reality. The Thieves Guild beats up innocent people for not paying debts, and even if they do steal from rich, societal leeches, they're hardly handing out the money to the poorest in society, they're keeping it for themselves. So I think the short of it is that A, the Dragonborn wouldn't willingly become a thief, and B, nor would they become a thief in service to the Mistress of Shadows, the Daedric Prince Nocturnal. So there we are, we're finally done with the Daedric quests, so moving on I'll be talking about some of the major side quests. The Forsworn Conspiracy is one of Skyrim's most maligned quests because its start is so promising and its endings well, one of its endings is so disappointing. So, witnessing the murder of a street vendor in Markarth City Square launches you on a thrilling series of missions surrounding an underground insurrection being organized in the city by the dissident Forsworn, who believe the Reach has been stolen from them by the Nords. But you are ultimately faced with a choice, to murder Madanak and his followers to gain Thurna's favor, or to join them and to help them to escape Sidna Mine. Siding with Madanak is the disappointing ending because despite allying with the so-called King in Rags, you are ultimately unable to join the Forsworn, or even just to stop them attacking you. After completing the quest, the Forsworn will continue to pester you throughout the Reach. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. What would the Dragonborn do? This is a tricky one, as it's a question of does the Dragonborn side with a guerrilla terrorist organization, or does he side with the Silverblood family, who, through their mining interests and shady dealings, run Markarth essentially as a personal thief? 
Neither is a particularly moral choice, let's face it. You could say that even if Mardanach's methods are unsavoury, at least there's an ideal that he's fighting for. The Silverbloods, meanwhile, are just in it for themselves. Let's also face the fact that the Dragonborn would probably side with Madanark for the ease of getting out of the mine. So I believe siding with Madanark is the choice the Dragonborn would make, although that doesn't mean to say he condones the Forsworn cause entirely. Now, onto factions. Which ones would the Dragonborn join, and which ones would he ditch? I mentioned earlier that based on the trailers, it seems that the Dragonborn is a warrior, but I don't think that the Dragonborn would pigeonhole himself necessarily. In the fight to defeat Alduin, he would probably utilize any form of power he could get his hands on, including the arcane arts. I therefore think it's perfectly legitimate for the Dragonborn to join the College of Winterhold and to rise to become its leader. The Companions is a slightly more complicated case. Yes, the Dragonborn would jump at the chance to join a band of fellow Nord warriors, but would he join the Inner Circle becoming a werewolf? There are a few reasons I think the Dragonborn wouldn't. Firstly, as Kodlak argues, werewolves don't go to Sovngarde, they go to Hercene's Realm of Oblivion. As a Nord, and the Nord Dragonborn of legend, I struggle to believe the Dragonborn would willingly sign up for a fate that so undermines Nord tradition. The Dragonborn surely has to enter Sovngarde as the ultimate hero upon his death. So the Dragonborn would probably join the Companions, but advance no further than the Silver Hand, the quest where you become a werewolf. The Dark Brotherhood is completely out of the question before you even ask. There's no way in a million years the Dragonborn would canonically ascend to the upper echelons of a sadistic murder cult, and going back to my point of political neutrality, it would hardly be neutral for the Dragonborn to assassinate the Emperor and to plunge the Empire into chaos. So the Dragonborn would instead side with the Penitus Oculatus and destroy the Dark Brotherhood, nabbing 3,000 gold in the process. Which, now I think about it, is a measly sum for single-handedly eradicating the deadliest group of assassins on the continent. I'm going to be straight up, I actually completely forgot about the quest I'm about to talk about. I came across it on the UESP wiki as I was doing research for this video. The Blessings of Nature is a minor quest that you can pick up in Whiterun. Danica Purespring will ask you to help her restore the Gildergleam tree. In order to do this, she tasks you with going to the Mother Tree, the Elder Gleam, and extracting some of its sap. Maurice is a pilgrim who has travelled to Whiterun to pray beneath the branches of the Gildergleam, and he's quite upset to see it in its dilapidated state. He'll ask to accompany you to the Elder Gleam to retrieve some of its sap, but just as you're about to do so, he pleads for a different course of action. He thinks harming the tree for sap is sacrilegious. Better to pray to Kinnereth for a sapling, which will eventually replace the Gilder Green rather than to hurt the Elder Gleam to get its sap. So you're faced with a choice, harm the Elder Gleam to retrieve the sap as Danica wishes, or let Maurice pray to the tree to obtain a sapling that can eventually replace the Gilder Green. It might not seem obvious in the moment, but the decision the Dragonborn would make here, as he is allied with the Aedra, would be to abide by Kinnereth's wishes and not to harm the tree. If you do decide to harvest sap from the tree, you'll soon see Kinnereth's displeasure. She sicks a horde of Spriggans on the player. Danica will be initially upset that you've not got the sap as she requested, but she eventually sees that securing a sapling with Kinnereth's blessing is the best course of action. There's endless debate about whether Sadia is guilty in the quest My Time of Need, but to me it's always seemed pretty clear that Sadia is the traitor that Alakir claim her to be. Sadia's story simply doesn't make sense. She claims that she's being hunted by Alakir warriors because she publicly spoke against the Thalmor, implying that the nobles of Hammerfell are allied with the Thalmor, but from what we know that couldn't be further from the truth. The Red Guards hate the Thalmor with all of their being. After the Empire signed a peace treaty with the Thalmor, the Red Guards kept on fighting alone for a number of years, eventually beating the Thalmor back. It wouldn't make sense that Sadia criticising the Thalmor would lead to her persecution, as she claims. The story of the Alakir is more convincing. That Sadia is a traitor who, for her own benefit, sold out a Red Guard city to the Thalmor and has been on the run ever since. The Dragonborn would do the right thing in this situation and hand a traitor in, for her just deserts. Blood on the Ice is Skyrim's homage to Agatha Christie. In this murder mystery, the overwhelmed and frankly clueless Windhelm guards are more than happy to delegate detective duties to you. Hercule Poirot, uh, sorry, I mean the Dragonborn. Anyway, eventually you whittle down the suspects and arrive at the unlikely figure of Wunferth, the court mage. You can choose to go to the authorities and have him arrested, 
or you can talk to Wynferth yourself and present him with the evidence, allowing him to make a case for himself. If you choose the first option, Wynferth is locked up, wrongly because he isn't the killer. This leads to another person being murdered by the butcher. However, if you present Wynferth with the evidence you have, he reveals that a, he's not the killer, and that B, he's been following the killings himself, and that he thinks the next murder will take place in the Stone Quarter at night. And true enough, if you go there, you catch the elderly museum owner, Calixto Corium, in the act. Turns out he went mad after his sister's death, and wanted to bring her back in some sort of necromantic ritual. Anyway, I think the Dragonborn would instinctually not accuse Wynferth and lock him up, for the simple reason that it isn't fair. At that point in the quest, Dragonborn has far from conclusive evidence, and so it's fairer to confront Wunferth with the evidence and to allow him to make his own case. To help a distressed jester, or not to help a distressed jester? That is the question in the quest Delayed Burial, when Cicero approaches you to help him find a wagon wheel. I think that the Dragonborn, not knowing that Cicero is a sadistic, bloodlusting murderer, would help him in this dilemma. The clown is transporting his dead mother, after all, or so he claims. In this video, I've tried to explain every choice I think the Dragonborn would canonically make in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. You may disagree with some of my positions, I feel that many will have something to say about the Civil War in particular. I've also tried to be as thorough as I can, but it's possible that I would have missed quests, or that there are quests I felt I couldn't comment on, where perhaps you think I could have. So please let me know in the comments below what thoughts you have about what decisions the Dragonborn would canonically make. Thank you for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed, and if you want to see more then please feel free to subscribe. Please let me know as well in the comments below any future videos you want to see on my channel. Anyway, thanks again and I'll see you all in the next one.